Having your lunch? Nah. nah. Big old load of vegetables. I love this, this um, so-called B-roll from the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. I've stopped it before when it goes over the United States. With the B-roll or the International Space Station? The uh, International Space Station. We're at night when you can see lights. That's so cool, seeing the aurora. Oh, yeah. I saw the aurora one time when I was flying back from uh, London. I like right there, they're going over Florida right now and just see the light pollution. Oh, yeah. I was flying over London and uh, I guess we were over Greenland at this point and uh, uh, and there was intense uh, aurora going on and I was looking out the window and I was yelling at everybody in the cabin to look out the window and no one, no one looked. Now, <laughs> really? It's impossible to me because because people spend thousands of dollars to go to a place where they can go and see Aurora, you know. And there wasn't one person on the plane who they didn't jumped. want to look. It was a spectacular view. I was going, wow, a bunch of jaded people here. That's going over us right now. That's the video I'd stopped and found every town I know. But there's some humans up in space that see this every day. I wonder if it becomes old. You know, not old, but sort of maybe more than less than run of the mill, but you know. I don't know, from what I've heard, it doesn't it doesn't get old. Maybe maybe after a year of being up there, you might get used to it, I guess. But for just a couple of weeks, no. I think every day you'd run to the window to look out. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be hard to get work done. Just so mesmerizing of a view. I We got people already logging in here. Mm -hmm. Saw Pekka was yeah. there. What else do we have? We got uh, Andrew Corkill. He's the first one to sign on. Good man. Pekka, second one. Uh, Richard Grace, howdy all. Uh, let's see. Harold Locke, Cameron Gillis. Um, Wajdi Zara, I think is how you might pronounce that name. Gazara, maybe. Hello, everybody. Um, Jeff Y says hello. Uh, Martin Eastburn, Martin here in East Texas. Uh, Jeff, it cannot get old. Hi from Windy, Arizona.
on the lunar surface, you have the ability to gather samples that can tell us so much about the origins of our solar system, and the samples returned gave us that information. That was what Apollo 14 did that was so trailblazing. They continue to believe that this mission might never get started. And mission control was pretty convinced it wouldn't either. First attempt, dock, couldn't get a hard dock. Second attempt, third attempt, fourth attempt, fifth, and a sixth attempt. Two hours. But it's that spirit and in mission control, in the crew, the faith and the confidence in their training, and they're able to work together as a team to really, to get that mission going. I got a hard dock here. Roger, Al, that's great. Super job, Stu. In the aftermath of Apollo 13, nothing was taken for granted. It took a lot of work back home to really reprogram that software to really understand what had happened there. We're on the surface. Okay, we did. That was a beautiful one. The man smoked with other than that with great things yeah, right on the landing site. Looks like you're about on the bottom step and on the surface. That's a bad bit, old man. Now we're on the surface, and it's been a long way, but we're here. Apollo 14 was an incredibly ambitious scientific mission. One of the things they had with them that was incredibly important was something called the MET or the rickshaw. Basically a cart, a cart intended to carry both those scientific experiments, those payloads, but also to return those lunar samples. And so that allowed that crew to travel further from the, from the lander than any crew had previously. Like any good navigator, the astronauts brought with them the maps that they needed. But there was a problem with these maps. These maps had been shot from the air. And on the ground, that lunar landscape looked quite a bit different. I think I like being up to your armpits is lunar dust. They found themselves in valleys that were deeper than they thought. They found themselves working up hills that were higher. This was an exploration at its finest. <laughs> so cool. About 95 pounds. See the samples returned from Apollo 14 were incredibly important. They told us so much about the formation of the solar system, so much about the material that makes up the moon. The return trip to Earth was a time to rest, a time to reflect, but also a time to continue science. A major portion of that journey home was conducting microgravity science, something that today we do on the International Space Station every day. That was a really a new way to think about what would the value of space be. Apollo 14 achieved all the science that it had hoped to achieve and it pressed the boundaries of space exploration in ways that future crews would build upon. And as we prepare to go back to the moon, uh, we definitely follow in the footsteps of these brave crews that went before us and build upon the scientific information that they returned.
Well, hello everybody. It's Scott Roberts and Kent Martz here uh, for our 29th episode, I think, maybe of the of the First Light Chronicles. So, uh, anyways, uh, we got a ways to go to get to number 100, but we'll get there. Uh, <laughs> um, this weekend looks like it might be a nice weekend for at least around here for astronomy. Uh, although we got a little bit more moon than. Uh, than we might want uh, for some deep sky stuff, but um, nevertheless, it's uh, it's a good time to go out and look at the moon uh, if if you got some uh, uh, skies to do it with. And um, today, uh, Kent is back with us. Uh, he was, of course, with us yesterday, but back again. And we're going to talk about Universe Samplers Chapter Six about star hopping and. Uh, so uh, now, Kent, did you learn astronomy through using setting circles, or did you learn it by kind of like binocular views or star hopping, or how did you learn? There, I've unmuted myself. <laughs> um, I, uh, you know, binoculars, and it just talking through where things were. And looking at looking at star charts with my dad, you know, a, a pocket atlas basically, which you know made it challenge because when we talk about it, uh, and I actually I have actually combined section chapters six and lessons six and seven because they're they're intrinsically linked, and so chapter seven really makes chapter six functional. You got to understand things, um, and so. Um, you know, the Star Atlas was better than nothing, but he didn't have a Will Tyrion at Star Atlas, Sky Atlas 2000, you know, where he could get down to some fine details. So, but again, I grew up where there was very minimal light pollution, you know, on the north side of a town of 4,000 people, you know, with a national forest going for 100 miles to the north uh, and, and literally no lights up there, mm. uh, a street light every, a security watcher every, you know, one per section of land maybe you know whatever mile or so so very very minimal light pollution so we could see a lot of stars just naked eye and so it, it made it easy to just navigate around um you know so today it's a little bit different but it's still a technique that that you can utilize if you if you happen to have a little bit you know decent skies so we'll talk about that so i just noticed that i remember seeing i think it was like last week uh alan shepherd's um shot golf ball shots you know, miles and miles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, apparently, there was a couple of uh, physicists that calculated the ball. The first shot went 24 yards and the second one 40, you know. Um, <laughs> maybe, so, maybe his aim wasn't that good. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and that was on February the 8th is when it came out. I remembered reading it, so just looked it up. Hmm. So, uh, well, he wasn't using a good driver either. He's using a lunar collection sampler shovel. Yeah, so uh, Andy is wearing a lunar space suit, so it's, his yeah, mobility is not the greatest in the world. Suit on and use a lunar collection tool and see how far you can see how far you can hit Tiger Woods or somebody can hit a a, a, a ball. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, I guess they've used some high resolution. They've enhanced the existing some of the existing pictures, and yeah. found and found the balls actually in one of the photos that I'm looking at it right Seriously. now. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you There's know you. You can Google it. It's uh, the New Hampshire Union Leader is, which is a real newspaper, uh, not just a fake newspaper name online. Uh, did a story on it. There's other references out there as well. So, cool. uh, just some cool stuff. All right. So, um, I haven't launched my PowerPoint yet. I guess we should do that. Unless you got something you want to talk about. Well, I do want to talk about, um, you know the act of, you know, of uh, learning the sky through star hopping. That's the way I learned. Uh, I had my, my first, uh, you know, aside from my, my small refractor here that, you know, I, I started looking at the stars and, and the moon with. I couldn't, didn't know how to find planets um, at the time. I've since looked at planets with this. It's been a lot of fun. But uh, I, I have my Coulter uh, Odyssey 13.1 inch Dobsonian. That's what that's really what I cut my teeth on when I was le learning the sky and learning how to do star hopping. And star hopping, you know, you basically are taking, you know, you get your planisphere out, you explore a constellation, 
And, uh, and then you look at a star map and you go, okay, I, I want to go after this galaxy. You're, you're stealing my thunder. <laughs> am I? <laughs> you am. Anyways, he said if I, there was anything I wanted to talk about. But one of the things that I found was extremely useful, okay, for doing all this stuff. And I'll let, I'll let Ken elaborate on this, okay? No, you're exactly right. The Telrad is for it's the price. It's cool of star hopping. I mean, it is amazing, you know, because mm -hmm. you, you turn it on. And what this thing does, what this thing does is it, there's, there's a, uh, a pattern right here, okay, that glows red. It's hitting against a um, it's hitting against a 45 degree mirror here. That mirror is once you plant this thing onto a telescope, that mirror swivels side to side, up and down, so you can get the parallax between your telescope and this device. And the way that you use it is you look straight through it, okay? And it is so cool because it projects these concentric circles. They're the biggest circle is four degrees, and it's two degrees, and then the little one in the middle is half a degree. Okay, you can just fit the full moon in the center circle. But you're keeping, zero both, power. You're keeping both eyes open, and as you move this, it looks like, I mean, it looks like this, this projection is actually against the sky, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, by using this, uh, you can, if you know how many degrees away something is, uh, or uh, just by looking at the map, you can jump to the object very, very quickly. Uh, even if you have a regular finder on your telescope, which lets you see fainter, okay, because this does no magnification, um, you know, this is basically gives your telescope a heads up display, you know, for targeting. Right. And that, uh, that, that's the idea. I have one on every telescope that I use. Yeah, I've got. I don't. I don't switch one back and forth. I have two on my two main telescopes. No, that, we sell them at Explore Scientific. You can find <laughs> them at your dealer. They sell for about fifty bucks. And yep. it's a great deal. And you know, we and, have them in stock. So, and we have them in stock, a decent yeah. stock of them. But what I like about them is that you can. You know, I've seen people print the 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 reticle on a uh, piece of plastic, and so they can use their star atlas. You know, depending on whatever scale their star atlas is, they make the reticle that big, and then they can use their maps to move it around to see where things are in relationship to each other. Because I've got two spiral bound Messier books I've had for over twenty years now uh, that have all the Messier objects, and it shows where the reticle is to how it fits on the other stars to get M one hundred one or M thirty two or pick your M object centered up, and it shows the relationship to the nearby stars. And it's, that makes it really easy to find M objects if you have that book and can flip through it. And it's it's makes it easy to run through the, the Messier objects. Um, not like if you memorize where the Messier objects are, but it's still pretty cool. Yes. So we got any comments there, Scott? I've got. I, haven't, I didn't have my screen up. Yeah. Yeah. Cameron Gillis says, that's so cool, Scott. I remember back in the 80s drooling over the Coulter Optics 13.1, 17.5, and even a 29. I, I saw plenty of 17.5 uh, Coulter uh, Dobsonians, which appeared giant at the time. Uh, the 29, I saw one, and I think they only actually made one. And that instrument was uh, put on display at the Riverside Telescope Makers Conference. It didn't work very well because the mirror was so large and their mounting system was not good enough for that big of a mirror. So um, so I think that instead of them spending a lot more money on the design, they decided to uh, kind of be one and done with the 29 and leave the 17.5 as the uh, biggest uh, Dobsonian telescope. But Coulter Optical, uh, created a revolution in, in Dobsonian telescopes. Up until those guys came out with their product, uh, if you wanted a Dobsonian, you pretty much had to make it yourself. And so that, that would have been within the realm of John Dobson showing you how to make a mirror, how to build the tube assembly and all the rest of it. And you can see uh, there is a wonderful video with John Dobson uh, on how to make a telescope uh, on YouTube. and. Um, so you can you can understand why the guy was so legendary. So Scott, a, a cautionary 
about backing up to tail rads, a cautionary. They come with a mounting plate that's about, I don't know, what, six inches, would you say? Yes. That has really, really, really good double stick tape. And in my yes. mind, I mean, literally, my bases have been mounted on my telescopes for 15 or 20 years They're in the heat, not. in the cold, <laughs> in heavy, massive dew. They have not moved one fraction of a millimeter. I mean, yeah. they're where I put them. But those are about six inches long, maybe seven. And so the problem is they don't fit on little telescopes like an ED-80. There's no place to put it on there. You can't put it on an ED-80. There are other reflex sites out there that you can buy, smaller ones. Um, uh, I, uh, the brands escape me right now, but uh, there are small ones that you can buy uh, that will work on a small telescope. There are red dot finders. We include them actually on some of our telescopes. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, the creme de la creme right now, uh, and, and you know, tell, uh, Teleview made a, a reflex side, I think, and um, a couple other guys made some high-end ones. Uh, but um, the Telrad definitely, I mean, for the dollar, it's it's one of the best things you can get. So, very nice. Yep. Yep. All right. Didn't mean to backtrack, but I had that thought looking at the questions and thought, you know, somebody with a little scope's going to buy one and go, it doesn't fit. So that's the only downside to it. Yeah. All right. So you want to have a lesson? Yeah, let's do it. Let's man. do it. Let me get it launched here. There we go. I'm going to presume I'm up and running now. Okay. Yep. So I combined lesson six and seven. Lesson six is a very short lesson called star hopping. And uh, lesson seven is eyepiece field orientation. As I was working on this, I realized those two things are, are intrinsically combined because if you don't, if you're at a telescope, especially a refractor, reflector, a refractor, a, a Schmidt Cassegrain, you know, whatever, a uh, Max Zetov Newtonian, it's different. And it's not just as simple as just following along the stars, and we'll cover that here in a little bit. So this is the universe sampler, Journey Through the Universe for Beginners. Scott, you want to put those up? We just need to, to you need to create a file and, and put those links up. So you can just copy and paste them when I start this every day. But spend your $13, support the Astronomical League, get yourself a great little book that is great to use for outreach. Um, it's a good reminder of how simple you can make stuff uh, without getting overly complicated. Probably the most complicated part about this is what Scott covered earlier this week on right ascension and declination. Understanding how the sky moves in relationship to the earth and understanding the RA and deck coordinate system versus longitude and latitude is somewhat of a difficult thing. So, and work on your observing club. Uh, you know, join the AL and and uh, work on your first observing club, you know, the universe sampler. So uh, quick lesson from uh, a quick review from lesson five. Right ascension is like longitude on the ground on the earth. Declination is like latitude on the ground, except it's up in the sky. Uh, just like every single point on earth has an exact longitude and latitude address, every spot in the sky does too. But that address, instead of using longitude and latitude or GPS coordinates, uses right ascension and declination. So I'm not gonna go into the, the minute details, but that's that's that. So star hopping, you know, star hopping is simply following a pattern of stars from one object to another. To do that, you know, so you can hop all, you can go a long ways across the sky if you've got a good atlas. Um, you know, you look for the patterns, whether you, and this works, whether you're using your eyes and talking to somebody else next to you, and you don't have a green laser pointer, um, whether you're using binoculars, whether you're using a finder scope or using your telescope, all of those work with, you know, star hopping. And as I said, it's just following over to a target. So that's simple enough, but you know, where do you find charts? Maybe a smartphone app will do it. I checked my smartphone. I've got three apps. None of them had, none of them had enough stars that would provide a good, uh, star hopping um, uh, roadmap. 
Uh, a planisphere won't do it unless it's a really, really big one because it doesn't have enough stars. Unless maybe you're using binoculars and you might be able to get away with it that way. But I'm really doubtful. You know, quality star chart, a pocket guide with a lot of stars on each page, you know, is needed. I have the Wiltarian Sky Atlas 2000. So that's what we're going to use. Okay. So I started looking, okay, what constellation do we want to talk about? I realized Leo is now well-placed in the evening sky for us. Uh, so what's there to look at in Leo? There's lots and lots of galaxies, dozens of galaxies. And nearby is about as many galaxies. It's like a swarm of bees. If you walked up to a, to a, a hornet's nest and kicked it hard, just, you know, in the Virgo cluster, there's, it's like a swarm of just a mad, mad hornets just all packing together. So here's a page from Sky Atlas 2000. It's page 13, chart number 13. And I've cir circled Regulus, which is the brightest star in uh, Leo. So um, let's, here's, we're going to star hop. Oh, okay, over here, that's the Virgo cluster. We could star hop from Regulus to there or use this star down here just below that red circle. Uh, but I thought, okay, let's just zoom in on this piece and see what's close to make it an easy trip. Okay. So that's the purple square and there's Regulus and you start looking, let's say we want to go over to uh, uh, NG3, NGC 3377, new galactic catalog item number 3377. Or if you want to go down to the Leo triplet, here's how you're going to do it. It's a real straightforward process. So for Regulus, we're going to go to Regulus. I pronounce it different ways, sorry. That's the first step. And these are all fairly bright stars. They're probably visible under everything, but just, you know, really light polluted sky. And we're going to go over there. And then we're just going to follow this little pattern around. This is a little bit bigger jump, but, you, you know, there's three stars there that you can sort of find the pattern. And we're going to jump to that star and then make the quick hop there. And here comes the long one. And over to, you know, uh, Leo 52. Um, if you look below that, that glowing red line, you see a couple of little star patterns. Those star patterns make it really easy if you want to go find 33, 38. It's right there. Now that you're 52, it's really easy to start looking for these little galaxies all around. You know, go up to 33, 46. You know, if you wanted to go up to star 50 and then work your way over to 3370, you can see how all this works, okay? And so this opens up by, you don't, if you've got a good star uh, star atlas like this one. Oh, I just realized I didn't credit Will Terry and I need to go back and fix this um, and credit the source. But as you can see, real simply, you can star hop your way across from a known star that's bright, big, easy to find in a well-defined constellation and work your way into this. Whether you're using binoculars, a finder scope, a tail rad, whatever, you can do this, okay? You know, you've now hop star hopped all those galaxies, all right? So that's star hopping. It's real simple, pretty straightforward. But chapter seven but is important for it, the- One of the things I will say though, is the skill of star hopping, there are some people who are really, I mean, remarkably good at it, you know? Well, um, and the more and more you practice it, of course, the better you get. Yeah. And when we talk about that, you know, the, my advice is to start with binoculars because it's the most they're easy. Everybody can handle them. It's a wrecked image. I mean, what you see is what you get. You don't have to worry about inverted or flipped. And we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. So lesson seven is important to start hopping because knowing which way to move in the eyepiece is not intuitive other than binoculars. So if you're looking in a daub, it may be correct up and down, but it's wrong left, right. But as the field rotate, it becomes different. In a reflector or refractor, there's ways to make it oriented correctly, but if your eyepiece is straight up and down, so you're looking down into it, but if your shoulders are parallel to the scope and you rotate the, 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 the second, the, uh, um, uh, diagonal, then all of a sudden the field is going to appear to rotate. And so these things are like upside down and backwards, left or right, correct. What's going on in that eyepiece? That's when it gets hard. 
And what's hard is for me, the finder scope that came with my, with my telescope moved one way, but the eyepiece then moved a different way. So it was a challenge to mesh those two things in my mind. And so it takes a lot of practice. All right. As it says, many new observers become confused. I know lots of fairly experienced observers still have to struggle. Still confused, <laughs> still confused by it. I mean, I, I, I have to look at, move the telescope a little bit to figure out, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, sort of, right. and sort of re, recalibrate my, my brain. You know, you can't get things to match up. Um, reflections inside the telescope are what's causing this change. A Newtonian has two mirrors, the primary and the secondary, and a straight through eyepiece holder that produces two reflections. One reflection causes the eyepiece field to invert, flip upside down. You know, the field is flipped top to bottom. The second reflection causes it to reverse image. So now it's upside down and backwards. So to move it up and over in the sky, you have to move in the eyepiece. It has to look like you're moving down and over in the opposite direction. Uh, what are you talking about? So star charts are always, you know, printed this way. I know people who, who will take a star chart, an area of the sky, and either scan it or if it's a program like Cars to Seal or something, they'll take a screenshot of it and then they'll flip it. So the chart they're going to use is oriented to what it looks like in their eyepiece which provides, you know, not a bad idea. This actually talks about holding the piece of paper up and shining your red light through it from the back so you can see it backwards, you know, and upside down. This is maybe other than figuring out how to make go-to works and do guiding and all that. This probably is the biggest challenge for the beginner other than um, just getting started with the constellations and, figuring out where stuff is. Once they figure out the constellations, this is probably doing something like this is can be a challenge. So we're going to talk about, you know, the problem is an uneven number of reflections produces an eye field that is either inverted or reversed. It all just depends on how things are, are, are done. You know, it's, it's, it's mind numbing, you know, and this talks about, you know, how you stand at the telescope and, and potentially how it is. So here's a chart that shows, you know, erect, the image on the right is, now notice that west is on the right and east is on the left. I almost wish that they would put north upside down because when you hold this over your head, this is this image shows you holding it over your head like a planisphere. And to do that, to get north on the north side, if you're facing north, north needs to be at the bottom so you can flip it over your head correctly. So that is even, confusing um inverted and reversed you know that's even reflections uneven number of reflections my mind goes numb looking at this it looks like the uh old test pattern for those of us who are old enough it looks like the test pattern on the tv after it went off the air almost i just start seeing lines and letters and stuff right so you know what i'm talking about scott you're old enough no i, I don't know what you're talking about so anyway <laughs> Um, here's the, in the first paragraph, some observers make transparencies of their charts so that they can copy the transparency in the correct orientation. Uh, in this case, you will still have to rotate your chart to account for field rotation. Um, you know, this is, you know, one way to figure out which way to move. They talk about in the last paragraph is simply watch a star and look at which way it drifts. And that's going to tell you which way you need to move the telescope to keep up with it. So um, it talks about in here. Uh, one good way to you find your telescope is to use NGC 2169, which is known as the 37 cluster. Now, you know, it sort of really does look like letter 37. Uh, this is images courtesy of Robert Visa. Um, you know, God has done some testing for us. Sure. It, and, and it really does look like a 37 up in the sky. Sure and so, so if you're looking at, at, at at this through your telescope, through binoculars, it's gonna look like a 37. But what's it gonna look like when it's flipped? Huh? It doesn't look like a 37 now. I sort of see a seven and a three, but 
you know, uh, backwards. that's reversed, that's reversed left or right. But wait a minute, let's introduce another mirror to it. And now it's, is it reversed? Is it rotated? Is it, what is this? And you can see looking through a telescope, how mind numbing this can be to try and figure out what you're seeing versus what a star ch chart shows. Um, star chart shows, star chart. Star, star, chart, 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 star, star, stars. Uh, so anyway, uh, does your head hurt yet? Cause you know, looking at those images, trying to figure out which ones they are made my head hurt. I was going through this going, okay, very careful of this. You know, when I was flipping them and, and, and inverting them to make sure I was doing it right. So yes, it's going to make your head hurt. And there's really only one answer to figure out how to do this. Practice, practice, practice. That's right. And, and that's just tonight. Tomorrow night, practice, practice, practice. And eventually you start getting it figured out. Um, that's why having something like the Telrad can make star hopping easier. Uh, once you figure out the size and, and, the, and the scale, something like the Telrad really makes this process uh, somewhat easier. So, um, review real quick. Star hopping is simply the process of accurately moving the telescope from an easy to find location to one that is difficult to find, okay? So you start with a known star and you know which direction you're going and you just hop your way there through fields of view. Um, success requires a good star chart. Without a good star chart, it's gonna be more difficult to do this. Um, so it's worthwhile to invest in some star chart that uh, shows good detail of brighter stars. An eyepiece field rotation. How the field is oriented changes the number of mirrors and knowing those numbers of mirrors based on what you've learned in, in the booklet here tells you what it's gonna be looking like in your telescope but that still doesn't account for rotating the diagonal, which can make things get real wonky real fast. Um, experiment in the daytime. Look at a sign or house. Be careful. Don't look at the sun. Not good. Ask Galileo. He'll, He'll tell you. Yeah. He will tell you. Don't look at the sun. Um, took him two tries, but he figured it out. Uh, experiment on a sign or a house to determine the field in your telescope, right? Be sure to rotate the diagonal to understand how that changes the view. And then once you get it figured out on the house or the stop sign, move the telescope to another object because that's going to, if you're on an equatorial mount, that's going to cause some field rotation potentially. That's going to make things look sort of wonky as well. And so you need to experiment during the daytime and then get out there and practice, practice, practice. And uh, our next lesson, lesson number eight, is recording your observations. Because, you know, one of the Mythbusters, I think it was Adam Savage, said the difference between play and, and science is when you're doing science, you write down your observations. And that's the difference between playing and doing science. And if you want to, and I, I wish I'd done this. I wish I had started writing down everything I viewed when I was young, because, you know, David Levy has that, right? Right. Everything he's ever basically seen. Yeah. yeah, he's, yeah. It's he's written, written down. He's got hand drawings and stuff yeah. like that. And uh, I, I wish personable. Yeah. And he records who, I mean, he records who he observed with and where you were. Yeah. I, mean, I, I spent a night with him observing at the Arizona dark sky star party. You know, I wasn't going to stay up all night, but he was out there. Everybody else left. And I'm like, going, he did. He spent, and, stayed up all night. We, he and I stayed up all night because I wouldn't, I was like, I am not leaving David Levy out here alone. I am not going to do it. And so we had a grand time talking about life. And, 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 and he was like, oh, oh, what's that? Is it a comet? I'm not like going, ah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be cool to be there when David Levy actually discovers another? Well, comet? That's where that's where I was going, and he yeah. uh, uh, didn't uh, didn't. He's like, "Oh no, no, false alarm!" And I'm like, "Going, darn it!" So, am I? Have I stopped sharing my screen yet? Not yet. There it is. There's a button. There we go. So, you know, that was cool to be up all night. But he recorded. He wrote down what he saw. I mean, he he wrote down saw hundreds of satellites as the sun was rising. We literally saw hundreds of satellites moving across the field of view, and he wrote that down. 
I wish I had done that when I started this hobby was a little kid because it would be I cool. Uh, you need to start because it'd be cool to go back and look at all, you know, my dad died in October. It would be so awesome to go back and, and, and live those memories again of, of dad and the things we did together like that. I, you know, so write it down, record your observations and it goes into pretty good detail. That'll be next week. So Scott, I'm going to call from my, uh, Yep. Uh, mechanic. I'm going to go ahead and uh, All right. we'll, mute. we'll let you go. I will yep. just, th what you mentioned was kind of a bonding moment, and I'm just going to share one of the slides from my uh, my presentation, the, the Power of Stargazing. And so the, it's just one slide, just something to leave you with on Friday here. But you take care, Kent. All Thanks. right. See y'all. Hey, thank you all for hanging around with us. I know we're goofy and, and uh, talk about strange things and have a good time. And, you know, that's what this is like sitting around a campfire you know, on a cloudy night, just having a grand time. Burning some marshmallows. And, That's right. Ugh, I hate burned marshmallows, but <laughs> gooey marshmallows are on my wheelhouse, but burned marshmallows, not so much. That's anyway, right. everybody have a great weekend. Be careful. If it gets clear, get out and do some viewing. Bye, everybody. That's right. Yep. So uh, what I'm going to share is just this one slide from my presentation, The Power of Stargazing. I give this presentation to astronomy clubs and it's really intended towards a audience uh, that both you know experienced amateur astronomers uh, understand and uh, but uh, really to uh, uh, share my you know my feelings and the feelings I've, I know that many of my friends have had uh, when they've been out stargazing and and the last thing I, you know one of the important parts of this is this bonding experience okay and, and bonding helps you develop a relationship with the universe through stargazing and studying current astronomical science. It leads you towards greater scientific literacy. And, but it also leads you to find those moments of tranquility, uh, giving you, you know, the sense of wonder. Uh, and those things, uh, science has shown, uh, research has shown, I mean, you can do this by hiking and spending time in the woods. Uh, uh, you know, you, you can go to a national park, you can go somewhere, get away from the city and do all the rest of that stuff, but you can also do this in your backyard. And those moments help prevent illness by, uh, you know, improving your immune system. And, uh, you know, they give you increased mental and physical health uh, because they help you reframe your experience and your relationship with the universe. Uh, you know, and things that we're doing tonight, uh, you know, or, or right now through uh, these programs is, is to give you also just another level, another sense of belonging because you guys are, all of you are part of the astronomical community. And, um, and that's something I think that uh, is very important. And that lineage goes all the way back to when you know, early humans first looked up at the sky and tried to make sense of it. So anyways, you guys have a great, um, uh, uh, you know, weekend. I hope that you have clear skies. Um, and uh, as my, my good friend, my pal, uh, Jack Horkheimer would say is uh, keep looking up. And thanks a lot. Take care. Hi, I'm Kent Marks. Today we're going to talk about the Apple Chromatic Series of Telescopes from Explore Scientific. The Apple Series of Telescopes have three pieces of glass in the front that provide great visual and astrophotography opportunities for the amateur astronomer. They range in size from the ED80 all the way up to the FPL53 165mm telescope. They come in the classic white tube as well as the spectacularly beautiful carbon fiber tube. There's three levels of glass. FCD1, which is the Essential Series, the FCD100 Series, and the FPL53 Series of glass. Each one has their own benefits. They are all great for visual and astrophotography. For more details and to purchase these telescopes, go to explorescientific.com. I'm Yagi Cox, a spacecraft operations engineer. I've been lucky enough to work for U.S. Space Command, 
in the commercial space industry as well. And now I'm at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory working on the Mars 2020 Perseverance Rover. Don't forget to visit me, The Virtual Experience, April 10th, 2021. It's the world's largest space and astronomy expo. Go to neefexpo.com. I hope you have a great time.